continue our series on uh, on the sacrifices in the uh, in the Old Testament. Um, we uh, read the text uh, in Leviticus chapter two, and uh, this is about the grain offering. And this uh, morning we are going to uh, to focus on the grain offering. Uh, there are sixteen verses in uh, chapter two. Uh, you will see that. Uh, you will only study one verse this morning. Uh, God is infinite, and uh, His word is infinite. The truth in it is so deep that actually you can spend years just to explain and understand them. Uh, in the past weeks, we uh, we studied the burnt offering already, and uh, we are now moving to the second, the grain offering. So there are five main sacrifices or offering in the Old Testament and we are going to study them one by one. Now our focus is on the uh, on the grain offering but just a quick uh, recap uh, for those who, who are not here or maybe you forgot what we studied before. Uh, on the burnt offering uh, we saw that uh, the burnt offering basically is uh, the only amongst the five Sacrifices is the only one where the animal that is sacrificed is completely burned. There is no part of the animal that is left for food because you will see in the other offerings they will eat some parts of the animal uh, and they will only uh, put on the altar only a small part as a symbol and the rest they will eat it. But the burnt offering is the one that the entire animal is consumed, is offered to the fire. And uh, we see that. Uh, this is, uh, there is a meaning, of course, to that. This is the first offering in the list, the burnt offering. And of course, we can relate uh, to our life with the Lord Jesus, our journey with the Lord Jesus. When we started, uh, the Lord Jesus gave himself on the cross for us. And we all know that uh, the burnt offering is also the fulfillment of those sacrifices, the perfect fulfillment. Thank you. Thank you. The perfect fulfillment is the Lord Jesus. Is his death on the cross. Those sacrifices were only symbols. And that's also why some of us we struggle to understand them because we think that maybe they should be applied later by later, but actually literally, but actually they are symbols. And those symbols have been designed by God to reveal the truth. A truth that we need for our growth, for our journey with the Lord. Not to understand those truths is really missing a significant part of the scriptures or what God wants us as prepared for us. So the burnt offering can be associated with that act of sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And in response to that, we say, Lord, we give our life to you. And I think one of the best ways that the Apostle Paul put it is in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, when he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So the sacrifices of animals have ceased, but it doesn't mean that the truth has ceased. The truth continues. And we ought to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And that's what we do through the burnt offering, coming and giving our life when you make the Lord Jesus and you go to the, to the water of baptism and you come out of the water as a new creature, we say, we offer ourselves to the Lord Jesus. So that's the bird offering. But then, once we offer ourselves, our entire life to the Lord Jesus, we may say, there is nothing more we can do. We already offer ourselves. So we should actually stop at the bird offering. Why we still have another grain offering, fellowship offering, sin offering, guilt offering. Why we need another offering, the grain offering? What's the meaning of that grain offering? Well, that's a fair question. I always offer my life. And indeed, some of us, when we walk to the, with the Lord Jesus, when we become Christian, we have been baptized and we think, that's it. What's more? But there is another one, the grain offering. What is that grain offering? Oh, sorry. Excuse me. I'm losing this. (laughs) 
All right. So what is the grain offering? What does it mean to us? Well, in order to understand this, I think one of the key things is to look at first the name. When you look at grain offering, of course, you see that the word grain is there. And this is quite interesting because amongst the five sacrifices, the grain offering is the only one which is not bloody. All the other sacrifices, you will have an animal that will be sacrificed, you will have the blood. They are bloody sacrifices. The grain offering is the only one which is not bloody. And that means something, brothers and sisters. The particularity of the grain offering is made of grain. And in those days, in those days, people actually, their basic food is bread. I mean, they eat anything with bread. And like in Thailand, you will say rice. They eat everything with rice. So they eat with bread. So that's their daily food. That's what they need to consume every day. Now, in order to understand what is happening to those sacrifices, there is actually a dialogue to the sacrifices. Those sacrifices, they are describes the relationship, how we relate to God. So you see in the first place, you come as a Christian, you give your life, so Jesus Christ gave this life to earth on the cross. And we respond by saying, oh Lord, thank you for the salvation. Thank you for the justification. I give, I surrender, I give my life to you. That's the first response. Now, once you give your life to the Lord, God says, okay, and we say, do whatever you want to do with my life. I give it to you. That's what it means. I give my life to you. And God says, okay, the first thing I will do is to feed you. The first thing I will do is to feed you with my word. And the word is the Lord Jesus. John chapter 6, verse 35, you probably remember that story when Jesus multiplied the bread. And then after that, he said to the people, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So we give our life in the burnt offering to God. God says, now I will take you and I will feed you. And as he feeds us, we need to also respond. That's a dialogue. And the way we respond is actually the grain offering. We come and we say, I eat now your word. And the word, I hope you know. When we look at the Bible, it will take my Bible, sorry. So when you say, thank you very much. So when you say the word, uh, please, when the, the Bible says the word of God, and you find that in John chapter 1, verse 1, when you say, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. When it says, I'm the bread of life, I'm the word. That's not the word. That's a book. When the Bible says the word of God is the truth that is contained in this. You can burn this. This is just a book. But there's a truth in it. And that's what you mean when you say the word of God. So when Jesus says he's the bread of life, and you remember in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, when Jesus says, man should not live only on bread, but on everything, every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's what it means. He is the bread of life. We need that bread every day. The Israelites ate bread every day. We eat the word of God. We need it. We need that truth. In order not to be hungry. He's talking about not the physical hunger, of course. He's talking about the hunger of your soul, of your spirit. There is a deep hunger in it. We try to satisfy that hunger through many things. Work, career, marriage, sex, alcohol, whatever. You will not be satisfied. You will still be hungry. To, to, to put an end to that hunger is the truth. And he's saying is the bread. Now, God says, now you are mine, I feed you with my word. And when he feeds us with his word, we taste that word. And this word is tasted. The word of God, and read the Psalms, David described it in a very special way. It's tasty in my mouth. And that word, as it is tasty, what is our response when we eat the word of God? Our response is that great offering. We come to God and we say, Lord, actually, this life, not only in the new life, but that life that is shaped by your word. I come to express my gratitude to you, to express how much I'm thankful to you. And you see, 
this is the meaning of the grain offering. Now you can ask me, but what does it mean practically? Okay, now I receive the word of God. But how does it, how do I thank God with the word that I have received? Now I have food. I receive the food, I'm happy. How do I respond? You know, there is a There is a few, few months ago, uh, Matisse, our son Matisse, <clears throat> the parents of uh, one of uh, his friends, or his colleagues, uh, invited us. So we, we don't know, I mean, we are not friends with them, they are from Poland. Uh, they invited us to their place. It's, it was our first time to go to their place. And uh, we arrived there with Matisse. Our whole family were invited for lunch. We went there and then we were amazed. They prepared, I mean, the food was great. I, I enjoy food, as you know, I love food. The food was really great, uh, which was a surprise for us because we live five years in Holland and uh, Dutch people are not necessarily the best when it comes to cuisine. But I can tell you, it was great. We enjoyed the food and they said, oh, stay and you can come back and so on. You can even take uh, some food with you and so on. They were very nice, very kind. You know, the immediate response in our heart was, we have to invite them. We have to invite them to come home and uh, we, will, we will make our, the best of our French meals. Uh, I know uh, Glenn doesn't believe me when I say that I can bake, uh, but when they will come, I will bake. And at least we can count on Marina when I will bake. You know, there is this uh, principle of reciprocity. When someone invites you, you want to invite the person back to your place. When you receive the food, the truth. We are so thankful to the Lord. We know what it is. We taste it. And we want to offer something back to Him. Now, how do we offer back? That's a question for you. What does it mean to offer back to God? Now, in order to answer that question, let's go first back to the scripture, the text that we are studying. Uh, the text says, in the very first verse, it says, When anyone brings a grain offering to the Lord, their offering is to be of the finest flour. They are to pour olive oil on it, put incense on it. I underline some keywords to help for the understanding. Uh, the Israelite people, they eat bread every day. That bread can, can, comes from the grain. And we say that the bread, Jesus Christ is the bread of life. That's a symbol. And that bread was precious to them. And when they have a good harvest, they will come back to God and they will give some of this bread. And they will give not any kind of bread. You will see the details, finest flour and so on. And they will give back to God to express their gratitude. Now, what does it mean for us in the 21st century? Now, uh, we have a... Uh, that bread that they will bring to God, I mean, in this chapter for the grain offering, you will see there are different elements in the offering. You have uh, the grain, the flour, the bread. You, will, you read that in the, in the text. You will study the other verses later. We have the olive oil that they have to put. They have to pour the olive oil on it. We have the incense, and we have the salt, which is not mentioned here in uh, another verse later. We will study that later. So we will see each of these symbols. What it means for us in 21st century? Now, the first one, the grain. So we see that the grain, the flour, that's represent the bread, and the bread is the Lord Jesus. When, brothers and sisters, we study the scriptures and we apply it to our life, what happens is our life becomes to be shaped by the scripture. And God doesn't want us necessarily to come and bring, I don't know, money. Though it's good to give your title offerings. Uh, or to come with uh, uh, great songs and great actions. What God wants is not your money. What God wants is not your voice, your talents. Though those things are good. What He wants is you your life. 
the offering we propose to God, the way to thank God is simply the life. We show our life to God and He says, Wow, this is pleasing to me. This son, this daughter of mine, read the scriptures, applied to his life to her life, and her life has been shaped. When he says the fine flower, you know, in Africa, I grew up in Africa, as you may know, and uh, our basic food is cassava or tapioca. You can find some of, some of well, cassava plantations here in Thailand. They, they, for other reasons, but we eat it actually there. And the cassava there is a root, and that root, uh, you can dry it, and then you can grind it, it becomes a powder. And they use that powder to, uh, to, to make a kind of, uh, not a bread, but a kind of, and then you can eat anything with it. So we eat cassava every day. And one of the things that my parents will ask me to do from time to time is to go and to buy the cassava. It's a powder. And then you go to the market and when you go to buy the cassava, and they will give you two instructions, my parents. They say, the best cassava is the one that is white. The color should be really white, very white, that's very good. And it must be very fine. So then, how you know it is fine? You put your hand in the flower, and then as you put your hand in the flower, the flower, say flower or flower? Flower. Uh, and then what, what happens is the flower will uh, can, uh, can flow through your fingers. Nothing will stay. It will be so fine. You will see there is no, it's perfectly even. There is no irregularity. It flows perfectly. That's a good, a fine flower. There is no coarseness in it. There is no irregularity. The granularity is perfect. You take it from this part of the start from the bowl, it's perfect. And you see, our life, when it is shaped by the word of God, it should be like the fine flower. When you come, someone sees your life, sees the consistency, like the fine flower is consistent, you see the consistency of your life, how the word of God is applied in your life. That's the meaning of the finest flower. They have to bring the finest flower. We want to bring to God a life that has been shaped by the word of God. Now you may say, yeah, but how does it look like? A life that is shaped by the word of God. Now, what I'm going to share with you is not by any means uh, to boast at all. I have many things in my life that I have to change, to improve before the Lord. But it's in His grace and mercy from time to time, the Lord does shine through me. And one of the occasions that this happens was uh, yesterday. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, as you know, I work as a, as a chemical engineer in a refining plant. And uh, this plant is very dangerous. We have sometimes implant shutdown. And when we have implant shutdown, because of some issues, mechanical issues, uh, it costs millions per day. So one of the plants is a plant that produces detergent and it had an implant shut down. So we had to fix the problem very quickly. And by the way, it was so serious that actually Pattaya, Thailand, was going to be short of detergent because we are the main producers of this detergent. So there was a panic in the plant. And uh, so we called experts in US uh, I mean, the company called the expert in the U.S., the one who designed the plant, and you have a teleconference with them, what should we do, because we need to start the plant very quickly, and the expert say, this is a very bad situation, you can't start like that, you're going to lose too much money, you better stop and open and so on, and then that's going to cost $10 million loss for only 10 days, uh, no, sorry, 20 plus days. And as I look at the explanation of the expert, I realize it's not correct. We should actually stop the plant. The issue, the, my assessment was that it should be fine. Uh, we can manage. There was a lot of debate, and finally they said, okay, let's try what Max said. And they tried, and they started the plant, and by the grace of God, uh, the plant is working well. So we saved $10 million. So now the managing director wrote to me yesterday, and he said, Max, uh, thank you for your courage and expertise, and so on. 
as I said, it's not to boast. I want to share with you something about how God works. And then I respond to him and I said this in green color. I thank you because he said we are going to have on the 18th, so this next Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, they are going to have a spirit ceremony. So what they will do, they will go and they will call everyone in the company, they will go and pay merit before Buddha, before the statues and so on. And everyone has to do it. And this is the managing director. Because the word of God, when I read it says, you bow down only before the Lord, you will have only one God. That's the first commandment in the Ten Commandments. I have to tell him, I'm sorry I will not come because I am a Christian. Now, in another time, I would just say, I'm sorry I'm busy on that day. Sorry I cannot come. But that's not a finest flower. The finest flower, there is no inconsistency. We have to say why. And we would be empowered to say no. Because I believe in Jesus. Because of, I also pray for the plant. But I'm sorry, I will not come. Even if you are not now he has not responded to me. He was not happy probably with the answer. But that's okay. And if I have to lose my job, no problem. Brother, the point here is, we offer to God a life that has been shaped by the word of God. That's the meaning. It doesn't mean our life is perfect. But the life of Christ in us, that's the perfect life. I would like to take this opportunity to clarify something about the gospel. The word of God. Many Christians, many of us, And I've seen that, I've heard that in many places, many churches. Many of us, we think that Christianity, the gospel, the word of God, the good news is Jesus died on the cross so that I may have eternal life. So that when I die, I will go to heaven. It's not wrong. It's part of the gospel. But if you think that is the gospel, then you haven't heard the gospel. Jesus Christ died on the cross, not that we have eternal life only and we can go to heaven when we die. He died on the cross in order that we may live his life, so that he can give us a new life. His life, brothers and sisters, the life of Jesus. Jesus is the bread. As you eat the bread, you receive his life. And his life is different. His life is beautiful. His life is great. That's what you need. That's what your, your soul is hungry for. But how do we get the life of Christ? By eating the world. Now, that's for the word of God. That's the grain, the finest flower. Then there's another thing. He talks about olive oil. He talks about incense on it. What is the olive oil? In the scripture, we see that olive oil or oil is uh, often the symbol of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, we saw that Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, anointed David, in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. The oil, so they make the bread, so the Israelites, they have to make the bread. If oil, oil is important to know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a shortener, short, shorten, shorten the bread. It's important to bake it. But spiritually speaking, that's the symbol of the Holy Spirit. We eat the bread, the Word of God, but we need the Holy Spirit. Now, why we need the Holy Spirit? You probably know that very famous song, Psalm 119, 105, which says that the Word of God is a lamp. On, from my feet, a light on my path. Now, the lamp in those days was like that. It was not electrical lamps like this one, right? They were lamps. In order to have the fire, they need the oil. So when they say, in their mind, when David said, the word of God is a lamp on my feet, he was thinking of that lamp. And that lamp works only if there is oil. If there is no more oil, there is no light. And you probably know 
many parables. For instance, the parables of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25. Uh, the virgin, they are, they are running out of oil, five of them, the foolish one, running out of oil, and finally the master, the king came and they could not enter and so on. So you need the oil to have the light. You can't understand the Bible if you don't, if you are not empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's why people can do devotionals. They can read the Bible. They can even go to Bible studies without the Holy Spirit. The word is ineffective. There is no light. It doesn't give you light to discern and to see and to understand. Uh, I think two years ago or one year ago, I can't remember exactly. I went to a fuel station to fill my car with uh, diesel. And uh, I filled the car and then I was about to leave. And as I, I paid and I was, I was about to leave, uh, the, the fuel station worker he ran after me and then said, stop, 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 stop. stop. I said, what, what, what's wrong? He said, you cannot continue to drive. You have to stop your car. Said, yeah, what's wrong? He said, no, no, I made a mistake. I didn't put diesel in your car. I put gasoline. And I was in a hurry. I had an appointment. I was not happy. I stopped because I have no choice. If I continue to run, I produce that oil, that gasoline and diesel, so I know what it does to the engine, it will damage the engine. And I don't want to damage my engine. So I had to stay, they change and they put the right fuel in it. The Holy Spirit, the oil gives light. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, or if you don't have intimacy with the Holy Spirit, the word is ineffective. The uh, Holy Spirit, let me clarify one thing, brothers and sisters. The Holy Spirit is not the power. Some people think he's a power. He's a person. But it empowers you and I. What does it mean to empower someone? David received the oil, the anointing oil. From that moment to be anointed means to be consecrated. So David received an anointing, the oil, the Holy Spirit. And from that moment, the Holy Spirit empowered him to do his ministry as king and as a type of Christ. When we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, we have that power, not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit empowers us in order to apply the scriptures. That's what is, that's the difference between those who read the scripture and can't apply them and those who read and cannot apply them, they are not empowered. Uh, to give you an example of uh, being empowered, uh, when I run with my son Matisse, we, uh, we like to run, and so we usually go to the lake every week and we run 10 kilometers and we uh, try to push it, uh, so we try to go fast. I notice one thing, Every time Matisse runs with me, he beats his record. He can do the 10K in 50 minutes. But when he doesn't run with me, when you run here alone, he run in 52, 53? Yeah. About that. Two minutes a lot on 10K. The reason, I'm not the power, I'm his father. But when I am with him, he's empowered to run more because I can pull him. He wants to run after me. The Holy Spirit does the same thing, brothers and sisters. When you have the Holy Spirit, you can read and then you can apply the scriptures. I, I discussed with Marina yesterday and I said, Darling, do you have some examples of how the Holy Spirit empowers you? And then she shared with me, she said, You know, I used to have those white lines. Someone invites you to a place, you cannot come, you don't want to go, and you say, Oh, Oh yeah, I, I will see, I will see, oh, oh, man, I, I will come, I will come. But in her heart she knew she would not come. But she said, yeah, yeah, I will come, I will come. And then on the day, oh sorry, uh, 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 I cannot come and uh, I had something. And those are what we call the white lies. She knows it's not good because the scripture says that your yes must be yes and so on. But she was not empowered. But now it's something that bothers her, that's something she cannot do anymore. Because now she's empowered by the Holy Spirit, she can now tell people, I'm sorry, I will not come. I have Bible I have this. She can say it. It sounds subtle, but that's an example of being empowered. We have many cases like that where people, oh, I could not come to church, I could not go to this, I could not go to that place because uh, my child is sick. Sometimes the child actually just have a small running nose. A small cough, something that 
doesn't prevent the person to go, but the person uses that as an excuse. This is a white lie. This is not being empowered by most people. You know it's not good, but you cannot, you lack something is lacking to execute the word of God. That's the problem of the Holy Spirit. And I have good news for you, brothers and sisters. You don't have to come here in front and I lay my hands on you and then you receive the Holy Spirit and then you can. No, you don't have to do that. The Lord Jesus gives us, He tells us how to do, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. It says in Luke chapter 11, verse 11, it says, the Lord Jesus Himself, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask you? Brothers and sisters, you only have to ask the Lord. Say, Lord, I see there are many things in the scriptures I struggle to do. Are those white lies? Don't get me wrong, brothers and sisters. I'm not perfect myself. I pray God to help me to remove those things in my life. And pray with the Lord. And we see the Lord enter. Help me, Lord, to be bold. To be able to say who I am. To be able to respond to this guy that I'm sorry. I will not come because I'm Christian. That prayer is enough, brothers and sisters. Of course, I'm available to give you more detailed teachings on the Holy Spirit if you want. Even available to pray with you, no problem. But you just have to come with a sense in your heart and say, Lord, I surrender my will. I want your will to overcome my will. What is written, I want to do it, but I cannot fill me with your Holy Spirit. That's what you have to do. And then we move to the incense. So we saw that the grain, the flower, that's the bread, that's the word of God. The oil, that's the Holy Spirit that empowers us. So a life shaped by the world, a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, and they're incense. What is incense? David, and this is not only one verse of our incense. You have many other verses. You can go to Revelations, you have five other verses there. In Psalm 141, verse 2, David says, May my prayer be said before you like incense. The incense represents a prayer. So when you burn the incense, it goes up. And in the altar, also, sorry, in the tabernacle, uh, the priest would go and would burn incense. And it says those are the prayers for the people of Israel. He's praying for the people of Israel. It's a symbol. The incense, of course, smells good. Nice fragrance. So those are prayers. So that's the meaning of incense. But what does it mean practically for us also? What does it mean practically for us? The incense. A few days, I hope she will... She will, uh, she will be okay that I share that I will not mention. Uh, a young lady came to me and said, I want to, I want to share something. And uh, that young lady was working uh, as a teacher. She was enjoying a good pay. Everything was going well. But as time goes, she felt in her heart that there's something not well. And where that, how did that start? It started with the Word of God. She studied the scriptures and then uh, there's one passage, Romans chapter 13. It says that we have to obey the laws of the Lord. And then uh, she realized that the work she's doing, that work is not properly declared, registered, to pay taxes. So the employee, some employer somehow is not paying taxes because not properly. And she was not at peace with that. Because the word says you have to follow, comply with the rules. And then she's empowered by the Holy Spirit. She could just say, ah, oh, given my situation, this is a blessing from God. Actually, some Christians would say, no, oh, that's a blessing from God. I've heard that. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, she took one more step. She talked to other people, she talked to me, she said, I don't feel right with this, what should I do? We talk, 
And you say, we need to trust, you need to trust God in your situation. Comply with the scriptures. Trust God. And you see what he will do. So what she does, she went and prayed about it. She prayed and then she got the conviction. She was convicted. She bring this before the Lord. Look this situation, Lord. What should I do? And the Lord convicted her. And then she made the decision to resign. She will lose her job. She will lose a nice pay, pay because she wants to surrender and please the Lord. This is an offering, brothers. This is a grain offering. This is a sacrifice. She has been shed by the Lord, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and she surrendered her decision to God. How many of us, how many of our decisions we surrender to the Lord? And how many of them we take ourselves based on our rational, our logic, and decide? Actually, when you see I surrender all to you, it means many of our decisions, if not all of our decisions, we go before the Lord. Especially when we have a doubt. We say, Lord, you have to decide. Tell me that what you did. And this is a beautiful example to all of us. I'm going to stop here by saying, uh, by giving you one more last analogy. See, brothers and sisters, the grain offering is simply our life that we present to the Lord. Our life that is shaped by the world. You know, you observe, we all observe that the children who grow up in a family where the parents eat junk food, they tend to suffer from obesity. And we also observe that children who grow up in families where the parents are fit and eat healthy food, they tend to grow healthy. The food we eat, our father gives us this food. If we eat that food, we will look like our father. We will have the same features of the family. If we eat joint food, we will not look like our father in heaven. Many of us feed ourselves with all of these, with our logic, with our rational. But not with the truth. Of that. And the grain offering is a reminder to all of us to go back to the scriptures, feed ourselves, to be shaped by that truth, to, so, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to take actions, not only here, but that's from here. And then to be able to come before God and say, Here I am. This is my offering to you. Offer your life as a living sacrifice. This is what the Lord expects from us. On this word, brother and sister, I would like to invite you to take a time, at least will lead us with uh, just instrumental music to reflect on those words. It was the Lord to help us to be a good, acceptable, grain offering. That our life be an acceptable grain offering before Him. It's not whole to be baptized, to be born again, to know Jesus, to go to the burnt offering that we need now to offer a finest flower, a different quality of life to the Lord. That's what he's expecting next from us. May the Lord help us.